Welcome to Dermatology Explained. Today's video presentation is on granular parakeratosis. This is the next video on our series on papular squamous disorders. Granular parakeratosis is also known as hyperkeratotic flexural erythema, or HKFE. It is a benign acquired condition that is very pruritic and can present with maceration in the flexural areas, particularly in the axillae. It is characterized by scaly, erythematous, and brown eruptions, which usually occur in the interterogenous and flexural areas. There is also an infantile form associated with diaper wearing and presents with bilateral plaques in the flexural groin folds. Granular parakeratosis was initially described as a possible reaction to personal hygiene products such as deodorants. However, the histology was not consistent with the typical findings in contact dermatitis, and topical corticosteroids do not always help with these lesions. It is thought to be provoked by friction, occlusion, and sweating. There have also been case reports that have noted the resolution of these lesions following the elimination of occlusion. Although they typically occur in flexural fold areas, there are also cases noting granular parakeratosis in non-flexural body areas, including the face. So therefore, occlusion does not appear to be the only etiological factor. Defects in filigran production may be a contributing factor. A defect in producing filigran from pro-filigran may result in keratohyaline granule retention and increased pH of the stratum corneum, which leads to a defective skin barrier function of granular parakeratosis was thought to arise as a protective mechanism. However, chemical irritation may exacerbate this process. And in recent years, there have been some preservatives and ingredients of cosmetic and laundry products, which are thought to be culprit agents, particularly benzalkonium chloride, as well as triclosan in bath oils. These chemicals may also result in a change in the skin microbiome, which may lead to skin lesions observed in granular parakeratosis. In terms of the epidemiology, it can happen to cases of all ages. It is more commonly seen in females, particularly middle-aged, older adults, and has been reported in both darkly pigmented and lightly pigmented individuals. So more details on some of the agents which are thought to potentially trigger granular parakeratosis. It's important to note that the causative relationship between benzalkonium chloride and granular parakeratosis has not been definitively proven. However, there is an increasing number of case reports and anecdotal evidence to support this association. Benzalkonium chloride is a quaternary ammonium cationic compound that is widely used as a preservative and antiseptic in various different commonly used products, including eye drops, bath oils, skin cleansers, sanitizers, and laundry rinse aids. Clothes that are contaminated with benzalkonium chloride tend to contact the flexural areas, particularly the axillary and groin folds. And this may explain why granular parakeratosis tends to present in these specific areas. Anecdotally, there has been an increase in number of cases of granular parakeratosis presenting to dermatologists in recent times, particularly since the COVID pandemic, which may be due to the increased use of laundry rinses during this period. In a recent case series published of over 45 cases from Australia, these Cases of granular parakeratosis were thought to be associated with the use of benzalkonium chloride. In terms of the mechanism of as to how this chemical can lead to granular parakeratosis, it's been theorized to have two potential mechanisms. The first mechanism is that benzalkonium chloride, by acting as a surfactant, disrupts the cellular epidermal lipid bilayers, which promotes an inflammatory reaction leading to dermatitis. The second mechanism is that benzalkonium chloride may eliminate certain organisms from the skin microbiome, 
therefore disrupting this and leading to the environment which can allow granular paraperitosis to occur. There's also recent evidence to support that benzalkonium chloride can cross-react with a number of other quaternary ammonium compound preservatives, and that as a result of this, patients who are now sensitized as a result of benzalkonium chloride exposure can then react to a number of other preservatives and result in a presentation of granular perichoritosis. A list of some of these cross-reactive pre preservatives is presented here on the right-hand side. So what common day products contain benzalkonium chloride? These are some commonly used products which have benzalkonium chloride as a preservative, such as Dettol laundry sanitizer and rinses, Dettol washing machine cleaner, Caniston hygiene laundry rinse, QV flare-up cream, as well as Aveeno baby cream. It's important to note that use of these products does not necessarily cause granular perichoritosis. It's more just to point out that these products may contain benzalkonium chloride, and it's important on history taking to consider whether the patients are using these products and whether reduced exposure to these products or stopping use of these products may be an option to see if their granular perichoritosis lesions improve or not. In terms of antiseptic creams, antiseptic wipes, and eye drops, they are commonly seen in these ones listed here, particularly with the universal wipes, which are commonly used in both health and day-to-day -day office and clinic settings to wipe down, for example, furniture. This can be a possible exposure risk for patients as well. Interestingly, a lot of eye drops, a significant proportion of eye drops contain benzalkonium chloride as a preservative. And even though it is used for the eyes, it is plausible that the skin on the face may become sensitized if exposed to this preservative. So what are the clinical features of granular parakeratosis? The primary lesions are keratotic brownish red papules that can have a conical shape. They may coalesce into larger, well demarcated plaques with various degrees of maceration secondary to local occlusion. The lesions can persist for months or longer and recur. Pruritus is the most common complaint. However, irritation is also a problem if there are erosions or fissures. Some patients may experience a flare with increasing surrounding temperature or sweating. The axillae are the most common sites of involvement, with both unilateral and bilateral lesions being described. Additional areas in intertriginous areas such as the groin and inframammary folds may be affected. In the infantile form of granular perichoritosis, bilateral plaques in the inguinal folds or erythematous geometric plaques underlying, underlying pressure points from the diaper can also be seen. Here are some further images demonstrating lesions seen in granular perichoritosis, particularly in the axillae as shown here. In terms of the histology, the characteristic feature is an unusual form of parakeratosis. The stratum corneum is thickened and compacted with increased eosinophilic staining. There is retained a nuclei present throughout this keratin layer, creating the parakeratosis. The most unusual feature is the visible retention of basophilic keratohyalin granules within these areas of parakeratosis. Other features that can be seen include spongiosis, perivascular and interstitial chronic inflammatory infiltrate in the dermis, and some biopsies may have psoriasiform features as well. In terms of the differential diagnosis of granular perichoritosis, this may include various forms of dermatitis, including irritant dermatitis, allergic contact dermatitis, and seborrheic dermatitis. Other differentials include intertrigo, candidiasis, inverse psoriasis, tinea corporis, erythrasma, pemphigus vegetans or pemphigus vulgaris, haley haley disease, Darius disease, extra mammary Paget's disease, and LCH. 
In terms of management of patients who present with granular perichoritosis, skin swabs should be performed to exclude infections such as bacterial and fungal. If the history and clinical features is very classic for granular perichoritosis, then a skin biopsy may not be needed. It is important to identify potential associated or causative factors and to avoid these if possible. This may allow the rash to settle in a number of weeks afterwards. Thus, it is important to identify and avoid products which contain potential culprit agents such as benzalkonium chloride or triclosan. Granular perichoritosis may also resolve spontaneously on its own. Since it is not an allergic eruption, patch testing is not usually necessary. In resistant cases of granular perichoritosis, one can consider treatment with topical steroids, antibiotics, topical retinoids, keratolytic agents such as lactic acid, calcipotriol cream, cryotherapy, botulinum toxin, and isotretinoin. Thank you for joining us on our video presentation today on granular perichoritosis. I hope you've learned something interesting about this increasingly common presentation. I hope to see you in the next video. Thank you.